storage part like we use the iCloud, Google Docs, or uh, OneDrive, or Google Drive uh, to upload our data, or uh, con maybe confidential data or sensitive data. Because uh, for us, convenience matters. We don't want to carry like hardware devices along with us everywhere to access our confidential data or data. Like even for the normal user point of view, our photos. So cloud makes our life easier, but only issue is we don't know where our data is stored and how it is being used or even how it is being protected. Uh, because as a normal user point of view, you don't care about security, right? So let's understand the cloud basics and some of the concerns related to cloud security and what can be done to secure the environment, cloud environment. Uh, first of all, what is cloud? Uh, cloud is pool of resources. It could be server, software, virtual desktop, applications, storage. It's a pool. It can be accessed from anywhere, on-premise environment, your corporate environment, from your home, with the condition that you have internet connectivity and you have a device which has browser or app connecting to cloud. There is no dependency on a physical location. And also, it's very easy to configure or provision the resources in um, cloud in comparison to on-premise network. Let's understand more characteristics of the cloud. Uh, as per NIST, there are five characteristics. First is on-demand self-service. It means you can access the cloud services or cloud management interface, log in into it, and launch the resources or provision the, ha the hardware or the storage space in a, within a minute. That's not the case with the on-premise environment. So suppose the uh, admin or the IT team will have to provision the resources. They might need to go through long list of approvals. Like it, it might take months of the approval, then talking to vendors and getting the hardware resources provisioned or delivered to on-premise network. But uh, as I said, it's not the case with the cloud. It's very, very easy. Just log into the console. Uh, there is no intervention required from the cloud service provider. You can launch the resources as per your requirement. Cloud network access, as I, as I said, there is no dependence on the physical location. You can access the cloud technology or solution from anywhere. Uh, resource pooling, as, as I said, it's pool of resources. You can pull the resources as you need, and you can release once you no longer want to use those resources. One of the main attractive feature of cloud is rapid elasticity. That means, uh, suppose you are expecting a very heavy load uh, to your website during a campaign or sale. So in on-premise network, what will happen? You have to uh, provision hardware, which you might not need after some time when the campaign is over. So you are investing a heavy amount of money, and you don't need the resources after some time. But with the cloud, what you can do, you can configure the environment in a way that whenever the environment sees a heavy traffic or load, uh, the environment will scale down. The resources will scale down to cope up with the load. And then once the environment sees less traffic, the uh, resources will be scaled down. It means um, right now, the cloud is able to manage the traffic. Uh, or load. Uh, in cloud, whatever you use, you pay accordingly. So that is how in cloud what happens, your capex get converted to opex. Your capital expenditure is getting converted into operational expenditure. You are not investing large or happy amount of money to provision data center, maintaining security or networking components, everything. You are just paying what you are using in the cloud. Uh, as for NIST, there are uh, four deployment models and three service models. Deployment model is how the cloud is deployed for the user or for the usage. Public cloud is something which can be used by uh, normal users, which can be used by government entities or organizations, educational and institutes. And in public cloud, resources are shared among customers. Private cloud is dedicated to one specific customer. It can be managed on-premise or off-premise. 
it can be managed by a third party uh, vendor for organization or organization itself manage the cloud for uh, their usage a uh, community cloud is where the organization they create community cloud for their own interest where when there is a requirement of sharing information and their objective and missions are same but they comply with same set of uh, security requirements like in us us government and nasa have uh, they have created a community cloud to share information within government entity hybrid cloud is uh, its combination of private public or public community or community private uh, so suppose uh, your organization want to host a critical or confidential data you can use private cloud so that it's not used uh, it's not shared with other organization or other customers at the same point of time they can host their website in the public cloud which is not as uh, uh, sensitive which is which is not critical and that has to be accessed by public so this is one of the example of hybrid cloud uh, there are three service models so it dictates how the cloud service provider and customer are responsible for managing the services so in on premise network uh the customer or the client of organization are responsible for managing everything uh, as per service delivery model there are three service model infrastructure as a service platform as a service and software as a service in infrastructure as a service the cloud service provider is responsible for managing the infrastructure global infrastructure as well as basic components like networking storage servers and virtualization technologies where customer is responsible for managing the os part patching middleware runtime data and applications so here customer gets the kind of virtual data center where they can host their uh, website they can uh, host their applications and they can utilize the environment their own way in platform as a service the customer is responsible for managing the data and applications Uh, it's environment where the customer can deploy or host their application, basically uh, used by development kind of environment. In software as a service, customer is not responsible to manage any services. Uh, one of the example is Office three sixty five, where uh, the customer just needs to integrate their environment with the um, cloud solution and then start using the mail service. So now we understood the. Uh, lots of things and cloud based solutions uh, but still there are lots of uh, security concerns so from the organizational point of view and even the higher management like ceos and cisos they are still hesitate to opt for cloud based services uh, let's see why so if the regulation and compliance say that your uh, data cannot reside outside the country boundaries or the region then there is a no way to go for at least public cloud unless the cloud service provider provides the private cloud specific to organization within the same country or within same region even the cloud provider says or claims that uh, they have proper security controls their environment is secure and they have services and tools to maintain the security but reality is Once your data moves from on-premise to cloud, you don't have control because the way cloud is set up and the way it works. Uh, in cloud environment, you one organization or one customer coexists with another customer. So if one customer is compromised, there is a probability that another customer will also be impacted. as i said the cloud is very easy to use uh, from the admin point of view or from the administrator point of view if we will have to just log in to the cloud interface and can access the services or from the devil hello uh, okay i was hearing some noise so even for the developers they can use uh, they can access the cloud Through the command prompt or through the SDKs using access keys uh, or the secret keys, but again, if the proper security controls are not in place, 
uh, like if an administrator is using very um, guessable password, they don't have an MFA in place and they don't have password policy in force. It's very easy for an attacker to close brute force and guess the password and log in into the environment. And once he has access to the environment, it means he has complete account control. Uh, even I have seen in my experience, the developers, they upload their code into GitHub uh, with all the secret keys and access keys. And these attackers in the internet, they keep uh, scanning the internet for access keys and secret keys. Once they have access keys and secret keys, you can understand they have complete access to cloud. It's very imp important to understand the security control uh, because it's very easy to hack if proper security controls are not in place. Also, uh, in cloud, most of the integration happens through APIs, application programming interface. Uh, and the integration happens with third party companies, third party software. Even the developers, they use APIs for the authentication and for calling multiple services. So if the API has more access to the environment than required, then definitely an attacker can utilize these APIs to get control over the environment cloud network or getting more access to the data or retrieving the important information. Like there is a recent case of the Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is an open source tool for the automation of the deployment of the application. A uh, major cloud provider provides the Kubernetes services. And we have seen there is a module in Kubernetes, uh, there is an API module, which is vulnerable for account takeover. So as we can understand, if APIs are not secure, that can be reason of data leakage or uh, information disclosure or account takeover. So due to lots of benefits like scalability, reliability, and cost optimization, business units, they start moving to cloud without proper due diligence. So what happens if there is no proper due diligence, there is no involvement of the security team or proper assessment of the environment or risk assessment, the, uh, the setup will be insecure, obviously. Uh, there will be lots of uh, issues there will be lots of gaps and that, that can be um, that can be exploited by external uh, intruders. Uh, recently, we have seen the Office 65 outage uh, due to the MSA service and a couple of hours, um, customers were not able to access Office 365. So we cannot say that cloud-based solutions uh, will not have any kind of outage if uh, they are not uh, properly replicated. So we have seen lots of cases of outage also. So these are very common for all customers or cloud customers, but there are multiple other concerns like vendor locking or the media sanitization or the data deletion. So suppose you are using a storage and you use this, now you want to decommission it, you decommission it as a customer. Now the same resources may be assigned to some other customers. And you never know how the data was deleted from the storage space. Another concern is forensics and e-discovery. Suppose you are um, uh, working on a very critical incident and you want a logs or image for the host which does not reside in the jurisdiction of your country or your law. So now there could be a conflict between cloud service provider and you that they cannot provide the logs from the host. It just does not reside in your uh, jurisdiction. So recently there is a cloud app which came into picture um, considering these kind of issues. So there are, there are multiple concerns based on the region or based on the industry the customer is. Uh, but we are limiting uh, today's discussion around these. So hypervisor is one of the basic building component of cloud and it is a software which acts a layer it acts as a layer between hardware or physical device and guest vm it controls all the guest vms and resource utilization so on top of hypervisor you can see there are guest vm multiple guest vms that can be launched and these multiple guest vms can be assigned to multiple customers so you can understand how the uh, customers share the resources on the same physical device. 
What happens if the hypervisor compromises? It means every other or all the customers are probable or probable to multiple kind of attack. There are multiple vulnerabilities related to hypervisor release, uh, like guest to host state. What happens in this attack? Uh, one guest VM is exploited, and from there, attackers try to compromise hypervisor. In VM hoping, one guest VM tries to uh, bypass the control uh, of the cloud service provider and exploit other VM. There are multiple root kits and then uh, VMware based root kits. And how this works is they install the backdoors in the uh, virtual machine guest VM and then exfiltrate the data. Side channel is something where, which is shared resource, like shared resource of physical hardware. It could be memory, it could be cache, it could be CPU, the processing uh, unit. So based on these shared resources, also there are multiple attacks. Now the CSP, Cloud Service Provider, they have various controls uh, like uh, virtual firewall, virtual IDS IPS, virtual agents to monitor the activity of the guest VM. But there is also the possibility that one guest VM bypasses all these controls and can uh, impact other customers. Let's see how. So Venom was one of the very popular vulnerabilities released in 2015 where almost every cloud service provider was vulnerable for this attack. So in this attack, what happened that uh, the disk controller used by hypervisor was vulnerable to buffer overflow attack. So one VM can exploit, can perform a remote code exploit to the disk controller and can get control of the VM. Once he has access to the VM hypervisor, you can understand uh, he will try to laterally move around and see the deep guest VM. And once he has access to guest VM, possibly he will have access to compromise different information or filtrate it. Here you can see that the AWS has released multiple vulnerabilities related to Gen hypervisor. So even though these lead uh, cloud providers, they take responsibility of patching the environment and even they publish the issue for vulnerabilities. But we cannot ignore the fact that there are lots of vulnerabilities related to hypervisor technology exist and that can be exploited. Coming to firmware rootkits. So these are the rootkits which uh, uh, exploit this firmware and then install the backdoors in the virtual VM. So in this example, you can see the attacker VM uh, exploits uh, the system format, which is a layer between hypervisor and the physical device. Once he has access to the system firmware, it will install the backdoor uh, and try to see whether other virtual machines are vulnerable to it or not. Once he has access to other virtual machines, he will do the same thing. He will exfiltrate the data, he will compromise the sensitive information, or take the control of, of other virtual machines. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, the side channels are the shared resources. It's physical device. Uh, it could be shared uh, CPU unit, uh, shared uh, memory, shared cache, shared register. So there are multiple research papers published on uh, such kind of attacks. What happens that one uh, one attacker VM exits quietly and try to see what other guest VMs are doing. So they see how long other VM is taking to decrypt or encrypt information, and how much memory or cache or register the other VM is utilizing. So for example, for weak encryption key, time will be less registry uh, utilization will be less and proxy processing will be less for uh, longer key it will be more so based on all these assumption the attacker vm tries to guess the encryption key or sensitive information um, and we, we 
can see that there are malicious use of public cloud. So as an incident response team member, I see lots of CNC hosted in cloud. And uh, what we do whenever we detect any malware or problem, we block those CNC IPs. But in reality, what happens uh, due to the nature of cloud, the attacker will shut down that particular host or server and launch new, get new public IP and maybe perform more sophisticated attacks because first time we blocked it. So now we understand what we are capable enough. Likewise, we see lots of phishing pages or websites hosted in cloud. Uh, we see lots of scanning exploitation attempts from the uh, various sources to our organizations. And most of them are automated bots. What happens if once our environment is compromised or server is hacked, the attacker, what they do, they also use our server as a bot or uh, maybe to perform DDoS attacks. Uh, like uh, we have seen very uh, fam famous case for the DIN DNA service provider, then where the service provider was down for quite a long time, and even the uh, big names like Microsoft, Twitter, and very very big names were out of service for some time. So another possible use case is like Bitcoin mine, where uh, uh, if our servers are compromised, they will uh, install a Bitcoin miner and utilize our resources for Bitcoin mining. And this is a very silent attack. Uh, it does not generate so much of noise in the environment. So we might know after quite a long time when this script does something or hampers the server, but maybe initially not. So these are the some of the use cases uh, where we see the public cloud uh, used as a malicious purpose. Uh, if we talk about outage, we already discussed about the Office 365 outage, but AWS outage also are quite common uh, because um, in June 2018, uh, their US East-1 data centers were down for some time due to power strike and power lightning. And even some of the hosts were not recovered. They couldn't recover. And even the Google Cloud, there were database glitches. So these outages are very common. It's just that the environment has to be configured in a way that if uh, one data center is down, the resources in other region are able to process the request and take the user load. Uh, these are the market leaders, uh, like AWS is at the top, and then Azure, Space, Google Cloud platform. And I took this screenshot from the uh, the article which Dr. Dean shared study. So cloud, so uh, cloud security shared responsibility. It's not like uh, it's myth that uh, once you move your data or resources to cloud, everything will be secure and cloud. The provider will take care of the responsibility of making sure that your environment is properly configured and secured. That's not at all the case. It's a shared responsibility, but obviously the customer can get benefit of the compliance status of the cloud provider. Uh, but based on the model, uh, like the model which we discussed, uh, infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or software as a service, customers are also res responsible for maintaining the security. But identity and access management is always the responsibility of the customer, regardless of the model they are following, they are opting for. This is one of the uh, responsibility model uh, from AWS. It's a responsibility model for infrastructure as a service. Here we can see the cloud provider is responsible for managing the security for global infrastructure and the basic foundational components like computing, storage, database, and networking, where customer is responsible for maintaining the encryption, uh, the backup, operating system, uh, configuring the network and firewall, identity and access management, even the security data. So cloud strategy is, in itself is a very huge topic. And I say I'm not very much expert on cloud strategy part. Uh, but there are a few things I want to highlight here. So whenever 
there is a decision that business units or business wants to adopt cloud. First thing is to understand the business requirements, business use cases, and what the value will be added once the customer will move to cloud. So to understand all these, there is always it's advisable to create a cloud strategy team consisting of all the cloud stakeholder, uh, business stakeholders and decision makers. That may be the, uh, the board of members or uh, information security team, IT team, operations team, business units, um, all the teams which are relevant uh, to make the decisions. Once you have a team already, we need to understand what kind of data we are moving. Is it, is it confidential or sensitive or PII data or non-critical data? and evaluate what model we are going to opt for, whether this, this is public or private or community or service model, because we need to understand uh, as per model, what could be the responsibility of the cloud service provider. Obviously, after the cloud uh, service provider evaluation, like which cloud service provider you are going to opt for. Then from the business point of view, it's very important to understand the impact on the business once you're migrating the data and what would be the shutdown time, what would be the impact on the business. And from the information security point of view, it's very important to understand the uh, risk associated with the cloud. So they need to uh, perform the cloud, as, uh, cloud security assessment or risk assessment, understand what the current status of the security in the organization and what they want to achieve in cloud uh, environment. So once they have a proper understanding and gaps identified, they need to suggest and they need to decide with uh, other concerned parties, security control, to make sure that cloud environment is also secured as on-premise environment. And uh, for the risk assessment, uh, they can consider the compliance requirement, regulation requirement, organizational security standards, and uh, uh, even the CIS benchmark, the AWS uh, best security practices, or Amazon or Microsoft Azure best security practices, they can consider all this to find out the gap. So, data migration should always only happen when the cloud environment is also secure and we have proper security controls. We we need also to consider how we are going to do ongoing monitoring whether we have in-house solution or we are going to opt for a third-party MSSP for cloud environment as well. So for after considering all this, uh, we need to have the proper policies uh, for the cloud adoption, standards, procedures, or guidelines for different teams, users. And we need to get buy-in from the management, from the users, so that they understand what their role is, what their responsibilities are. Last, most important thing is the expertise and training. Because uh, as a developer or as, as an IT administrator or as a user, as an IT, as an information security team, we are very much used to of on-premise environment. We might not have necessary skills to work for cloud or maintain the security in cloud. So it's uh, crucial to train the employees to have proper skills and maintain the same set of security, same set of work, what we are doing in on-premise, same as in cloud environment. Uh, these are some of the best practices, uh, definitely not all, to consider while moving or while migrating to cloud environment. Authentication and identity access management, encryption and key management, Task management, uh, network security, backup, monitoring and logging, or this uh, vulnerability management. But uh, best practices again depends on the uh, compliance and regulation requirements and in the region you are working or for the industry you are working for. Maybe uh, the um, oil and gas industry will have certain other requirements or other best practices to condition, consider or health sector would have different uh, concerns or uh, best practices to consider. But these are some of the common uh, best practices that can be applied to uh, cloud environment for the security for the security purpose. So I have more experience in AWS, so I'm going to tell how 
we can implement these best practices to the AWS environment. So first, uh, if you talk about authentication and identity access management, AWS has uh, various features that you can enable to make sure your authentication is same as your organizational authentication policy uh, or password policy. Like you can set up minimum password length, you can have a combination of uppercase, lowercase, you can set the password expiry, you can set the password to use. So uh, I would say that uh, the Amazon or AWS or Azure or Cloud, or Google Cloud, they have control. It's just that we need to know how to configure it and what to configure it. So uh, we can enforce the proper strong password policy from AWS control for the users. Then if you talk about identity and access management, it's very, very important to uh, not assign permissions directly to users rather than creating group and rules. Why? Because as we start moving different projects to cloud, it's very difficult or complex to manage each and every user and permission. So it's always advisable to use roles and assign permissions and then uh, assign those roles to go so that we need not to have that kind of complexity where uh, certain users have more permissions than required. And here you can see, uh, this is one of the screenshot of the root account of uh, AWS Cloud where you can see the security status, right? You can see the for this environment, you don't have MSSS. Uh, you have, you don't have IAM password policies set, uh, and you have certain uh, other measures which are not set. So based on your organizational policy and the uh, requirement, you can set certain controls here as well for the identity and access management. Uh, then another important aspect is data security, injection and key management, uh, because earlier we discussed about the uh, vulnerable management interface, or we discussed about hypervisor related issues or vulnerabilities where the environment itself, hypervisor itself is not secure. So if you are storing your data as a plain text, uh, there is a probability that when your account is hijacked, or account is compromised, your data is insecure, lying in plain text. And then you can use those data to perform or uh, leak the data. So it's very important you encrypt the data uh, and encryption can happen in multiple ways. You need to encrypt the data while it is in transit and while it is in rest. So uh, from the AWS point of view, there are various options to encrypt the data. You can encrypt the data at client side, where the client is responsible for maintaining the encryption. Client encrypts the data and upload it to AWS uh, environment. And uh, uh, if client doesn't want, don't want to encrypt the data, it can also opt for the server side encryption, where the AWS will encrypt the data and store it in the environment. Uh, Another thing is to discuss about the key management uh, because if you are encrypting the data, but if you are not managing the key keys, then there is no, I mean, there is no mean uh, of encrypting the data if your key management itself is a vulnerable. Like the uh, case we have seen in Marriott, uh, where the data, data was compromised, but with that, the keys were also compromised. So for the key management, there are multiple ways to manage the key. You can manage the key at the client side, where the client will be responsible for managing the key, or client can opt for third party services to manage the key. Also, client can opt for or use the services in AWS to secure their key or key management. Another thing is AWS can also manage the key on behalf of customer. So there are multiple ways to manage key. It's just that for the requirement be what kind of data you are going to save and what kind of data you are storing. So based on the business requirement and risk assessment, you can also data decide the key management you are going to opt for. Um, and seeing the ongoing threat, seeing, seeing the ongoing attacks or vulnerabilities, it's very important to monitor your cloud environment the way on-premise environment is being monitored. 
So we discussed about the API issues, API vulnerabilities. It's very important to log all API calls to your cloud environment to see who has access to what. Collect all the logs from various sources. And then if you are going to opt for anything like a Splunk or you are going to opt for any third party MSSP, they have their default use cases. But with the time, with the understanding of the environment, build more cases, set up more alerts and incidents to detect the breach, to detect the threat. Uh, and set up even given security. It means whenever something is being detected, act upon that. The few cases should be automatic. And we can do it in AWS. Let's see how. These are the AWS services provided to monitor the environment and to log various uh, log sources. So CloudTrail logs the all API calls to the environment. So it should be enabled if, you're, if you have environment set up in AWS Cloud so that you can log all the calls and see who is making what changes. Guard duty detects all the malicious behavior. It collects logs from different sources, uh, like from your uh, Cloud DNS, from S3 buckets, or from different hosts. And it keeps track of the malicious behavior. Cloud was acts as a log collector, so you can forward the logs from CloudTrail and Rajiv to CloudWatch, and then set up some use cases to alert. Cloud config tracks all your resources in the cloud environment. It also tracks historical changes, so you can see who has made changes on your resources trend. Suspect Advisor is basically used for um, cost optimization for tracking the CPU performance, but it has a module for security as well. Uh, there are some default cases to check the misconfiguration on the different resources, like for the SP bucket, for IAM policy, and certain other resources. AWS Inspector is a uh, uh, vulnerability scanner. Uh, there are agents. You need to install the agents on the host. It is scanned and sees what patches are missing and how the hosts are vulnerable. Uh, so here we can see uh, uh, architecture. So as we discussed about CloudTrail. So what CloudTrail does, it tracks all the API calls from outside to the SDK, to the CLI, to the management console, to all the resources in AWS environment. Uh, different set of resources. Once it tracks, it has to send those details somewhere else. So it can send the logs to CloudWatch, which acts as a log collector, or to your third, uh, third party stream or Splunk or whatever thing you are going to use. Or to a three bucket, uh, three bucket is a storage. Uh, so suppose you have requirement to store logs for longer time, you can utilize that three bucket to store the logs. From a three bucket also you can forward the logs to your SIM, forward the logs to your third-party MSSP, or whomsoever you want to forward the logs for the monitoring purpose. From CloudWatch also, you can trigger the alert to the administrator, to the IT team, if there is any misconfiguration or if there is a malicious API call is observed. So you have to con configure the cloud CloudWatch accordingly. Uh, there are other services that we discuss about the monitoring, like the that advisor, there is a security module in it, which checks uh, the misconfiguration. And you can generate the report and share with the consent teams or stakeholders to fix those issues. As I said, in AWS Inspector is the agent, uh, which has to be installed on host or to see the missing patches to see the misconfiguration. Once that is done, you can generate the report and review the findings. Um, again, about the guard duty, uh, guard duty collects all the logs and uh, send it to CloudWatch, which acts as a uh, log collector. So from here, as I uh, discussed about the event-driven security, how it can be configured. So Lambda function are something, uh, the function work on the server less technology. So wherever there is a criteria matches to an event, this Lambda function will generate uh, or behave automatically. So you can uh, write a rule uh, whenever there is a criteria matches or whenever there is a malicious behavior, this lambda function can automatically change the WAP rule to block the malicious behavior or the uh, outbound connection to IoT. These functions can also block the rules in uh, uh, NACL or the security groups. 
to prevent the malicious use of your account. And also you can trigger the alert using Amazon SNS to customers. So uh, this is about the event driven security, how we can uh, configure the environment to automate, to automate certain changes or to stop the malicious activity in the environment. Uh, so maintaining network security or the review of the network diagram whenever any account, when you, whenever any business needs, wants to move to cloud, that's very important. Uh, because uh, different uh, business units have, we have different requirements. Maybe they want to move their development, their production, their staging environment to cloud. So now you need to segregate it and uh, through the private and public subnet so that only the production environment is accessible from the cloud. And your, uh, uh, your uh, uh, staging environment or development environment is restricted to private subnet only. So there, is, there are various ways to restrict uh, in AWS. Uh, you can have security groups for the resource, resources like host. You have, can have networks for the subnet restriction. You can have an internet gateway. You can configure only to allow certain uh, traffic, not everything. You can have virtual private uh, gateway to uh, connect to your on-premise environment uh, so to have the proper or uh, secure communication to your on-premise environment. So all these uh, controls or the tools can be implemented to secure the uh, cloud environment. Uh, OS security and patching, as it's important for on-premise networks, same as the case with the cloud environment. It's very uh, uh, important to maintain the patching uh, in the cloud environment itself. Uh, only thing is uh, the, we need to have the images, uh, standard images that we can share with the um, administrator or the IT team so that uh, they can uh, deploy this standard images or golden images across the host. And there should be an automated way to do it. Do it. Because uh, for the AWS, there are various scripts like Pop and Chef uh, to automate the deployment uh, because they cannot go and patch each and every host. They might miss you. So there should be always automatic way to deploy the patches in the cloud environment. Um, as we discussed about various outages, so uh, we need to make sure that our environment is properly packed up for our uh, uh, sensitive or necessary information or the resources are backed up. So for that, there are uh, various services in uh, AWS, uh, S3 bucket, which uh, is stores or uh, information in object format, it's accessible from internet. And it provides certain features to replicate it across various regions. So if one uh, region is facing any outage, uh, still the access to data is available from other regions. Uh, Glacier is used for archiving purpose. So suppose you have requirement to store data for longer time, you can use Glacier for the uh, archive data. Then storage gateways used for uh, uh, transferring your data from on-premise to uh, cloud. So maybe you want to take backup from your uh, on-premise to cloud environment. Then electronic file storage is used by one uh, EC2 instance for uh, analytical purpose. If there is a requirement of more memory, it can be used. And uh, EBS, uh, which is electronic block storage, uh, it's also used with uh, host in uh, cloud and various EC2 instances. So it's uh, uh, fault tolerant. So it's based on the block technology. If one block uh, is filled, uh, still the data is, can be recovered from block, other blocks. So all these storage options, whatever we have here, we need to make sure these are uh, replicated. So we need to have one set of copies into other regions or other uh, uh, zones. So that is, if there is an outage, we always have the tax ability. Uh, so all the lead cloud providers like Cloud, Azure, and um, like uh, AWS, Azure, and uh, Google Cloud, they have their three tiers available. So for around one year, so if you are interested to learn more, you can create your own lab and learn. And just play around different services, what you can do, how can you 
make me secure. Um, uh, these are various certifications in cloud, like CCSP from IC Square and uh, CCSP from CSA Alliance. Even uh, Google has various certifications. Microsoft has various certifications. AWS has various certifications. So based on the interest, and it's not necessary always to go for certification, but you have if you have interest, you can uh, go for the certification as well. Uh, so this is all from my side today. And I believe I would have not covered entire cloud uh, technology or cloud security because it's very vast uh, and you cannot cover it in one session. And based on the experience, I put together this slide, uh, what I know and what I can share. But definitely I would expect uh, other ladies from our group to come with her. Yeah, other concepts or uh, other security um, measures that we can put and that we can discuss or maybe various uh, use cases or case studies like if some cloud environment is teach we can discuss and we can understand how uh, what controls uh, uh, or measures were taken to secure the environment so uh, that's about uh, today from me uh, if you have any question uh, you can feel free to ask. Excellent, excellent session, Sapne. Th Sapna, thank you very much. Uh, do you want to start by uh, replying to the questions on the chat? Okay, okay, sure. Uh, let me see. Chat. Okay, sure. Uh, I can uh, say the question if uh, Abir allows me verbally. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, first, thank you so much, Sabna. What a great start for our uh, knowledge sharing uh, sessions with such a rich and very beneficial and professional presentation. Uh, we really appreciate that. When we talk about cloud, we are talking about f various uh, flavors. But the main security aspects uh, that everyone is concerned about is the public one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about Act, uh, Cloud Act, which has been passed by US, or even just recently Australian government has passed some uh, encrypt decryption and uh, enablement of any encrypted data. Mm -hmm. Such acts by the government is big challenges for the providers of uh, the public clouds, because this will be like uh, a true uh, violation of confidentiality of the users. How can we, we as customers, uh, react towards that? Just stop going to the public cloud or even encrypting? And if you say encrypting now, the Australian government has passed a law to have the right to decrypt whatever information it requires to investigate. Yeah, yeah so again it's it's depend on the regulation so suppose uh, your regulation says that you cannot host your data outside the country outside the region you should not you should not go for public cloud at all and when there is a business requirement and again it depends on the risk assessment or the business case where you think that the information is not as critical or not as confidential and you have appetite for that risk then you should go for public cloud with the encryption. But again, the first point is when you think that your information is very proprietary or very much critical and your compliance regulation says you should not go and your data should not go outside the country, outside the region, you should not go for public cloud. As per my understanding. But anyone else can uh, jump in and discuss about this. Reem, uh, you, you have a raised hand. Uh, you have another question. Hello. Uh, I have a question too. This is Irene. Sapna, thank you very much for your time and for presenting to us. There was one part actually which I didn't get. Uh, yeah. Uh, there was a part which I didn't get clearly because uh, the line got a bit uh, choppy. So mm -hmm. it was on that slide when you were showing about the 
uh, possibility of uh, hypervisor attack. So my question, uh, mm -hmm. just for clarification, on mm -hmm. hypervisor attacks, is there a possibility that when one client gets compromised, the other mm -hmm. clients on the same cloud can uh, also be compromised? Uh, is this what you mean by VM hopping? Yes, that's correct. That's correct. So there are various ways. Uh, if one VM is compromised on the same physical hardware, there is a possibility that another VM, yes, VM can also be compromised. Uh, as I discussed about the Venom, Venom vulnerability, which was released in 2015, uh, that is a 100% sure case that where if one VM is compromised, another VM can also be. And there are various uh, firmware rootkits uh, which can compromise the guest OS. So I, I was reading about one article uh, now, where uh, these firms were based toolkit uh, like Blue Pill or uh, Russian Ghost or Vitriol. These are certain examples of the rootkit. Uh, again, if they are able to compromise the form where they can have or possibly they can have access to other guest VMs. Uh, so, so it's like a lateral transfer, no? Uh, yes. In a network? Yes, yes, that's correct. It's kind of lateral transfer. Because what will happen, an attacker will try to first access one guest VM, then try to uh, escalate privileges, access to the hypervisor, and then from hypervisor, it will try to laterally move and see whether other guest VMs are vulnerable or not. And uh, the cloud service provider, they have controls, like they have virtual firewalls, they have virtual IS, IPS, they have virtual agents too. Make sure that these bounties are segregated between one guest VM to another guest VM. But as we discuss about various kinds of attacks, like Venom or firmware rootkit, they have always ways to bypass and do things silently so that the alerts are not triggered. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, sorry if I may ask another question. I know there are other questions huh, on the line. So if, uh, for example, we are on the same cloud and my VM was compromised, mm -hmm. or let's say your VM is compromised, mm -hmm. does it mean that, uh, who, whose responsibility is it then if uh, there is a lateral transfer among the other VMs in the cloud, on the same cloud? So hypervisor is always comes under the responsibility of cloud provider because hypervisor is something which even you know all the models like infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. Hypervisor always comes under the responsibility of cloud service providers. They are responsible to patch hypervisor related vulnerabilities or if anything happens with the hypervisor. Mm, I see. Yeah, thank you. I'll give the floor to the others. Uh, okay, anyone else? I, I, I'll ask another question from my list. How about the G, How about the GDPR? How does the cloud provider implement this? Uh, I would say GDPR is not my cup of cake. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> okay, okay. I'm not into governance. I am into like managing day-to-day -day operations. I see. Uh, I see. So uh, like mapping GDPR to cloud uh, would be maybe another topic to discuss or somebody else can take up this up. <laughs> Uh, okay, okay. And those are two, those links that you sent for us to play around and uh, create our own lab, uh, can you send that to us, please? Yeah. And yes, someone, yes. someone also asked if you can share to us the presentation. Or? Yes, yes, I can share the presentation and I can share the link. So these are the links, your links, you, just to uh, you, you need to register to the account. Once you register, you can access the account and then play around the uh, different services of the cloud provider. Uh, one more question, our last question from my side, if I may. Uh, Seven, if you can enlighten us as a, a way of uh, customers to try to make it hard for those who will try to penetrate our confidentiality. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the recommendations was in, uh, to have the uh, infrastructure the public cloud provided by a vendor, and mm -hmm. then you can have uh, all of that encrypted through 
uh, another vendor who provide you with the apps mm -hmm. and you know, for you to host it. Will that really help or it will be penetrated anyways? Uh, uh, it's, it's about the key management, right? Uh, injection key management. So suppose uh, we as a customer, we are not specialized in key management, right? So there are two ways. Either we can opt for AWS services to manage the keys on client behalf, or we have another vendor to manage key on behalf of customer. Maybe they utilize, they just provide the software, they just provide the technology to manage the keys in client's environment or customer's environment. That could be the case. So if customer is not very much specialized in the field of key management, they can opt for third-party service provider, third-party services provider can come into the on-premise environment, set up the key management services for uh, clients. And then from there, clients can manage the key, uh, key issues or manage the keys. Or another way is to, in AWS, there is a, a key management uh, service called AWS HSM. So customer can opt for that also. But again, based on the risk, if you don't want to store your key management uh, infrastructure in AWS, uh, right, because then you will have your data and key management both managed by cloud. So if you think that you want to segregate, you want to manage your key in on-premise environment, you can do that based on the risk of the environment. Okay, thank you so much, Isabel. Thank you so much, You've done a wonderful job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are we done uh, with questions or someone else has uh, still a question? Um, so far on my side, nothing else. Sapna, I just want you to know that there are others who wanted to join the Zoom, but they just cannot manage to connect through the Zoom. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we, I believe the uh, session is being recorded and yes. this will be shared to our uh, group, right? Um, so, uh, who's recording it, by the way? Uh, yes. Ab yes. Abir, you can share it, no? Yes, yes, I will share the link. It gets sent to me after the meeting. Uh, so I'll share the recorded link uh, on the LinkedIn group and on the WhatsApp group as well. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Very Thanks nice. A lot. <laughs> thank you, Sapna. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Good night. Yes, thank you, Sapna. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.